Hey guys, God bless you. Welcome this morning. God bless your heart. I hope that you are well. Thank you all for your prayers and support over myself and Mara. We have now uh, come through this horrible coronavirus and we are fighting fit again. We're ready to get on with the work of the Kingdom of God. So don't forget, if you have missed any of the current series we're in, which is on Abram, you can go to Effective Life Church website, which is www.effectivelifechurch.org, or you can go to my own website, which is www.effectivelifeministry.com and you'll be able to catch up on anything you might have missed out on. Please remember to go to our Facebook pages, like those, share on social media. It's really about getting the word out. And uh, this week and uh, uh, previous weeks, we've had quite a lot of contact from overseas, and we're getting the word of God uh, around the world, and that's what it's about. So it's about strengthening the believer and bringing the good news and uh, the good news of salvation to those who don't know Jesus. So, bless your heart. We will uh, dive in this morning. We are on part seven. Can you believe it? Part seven in our series. So, let's pray before we begin. So, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to lead and guide us this morning, that you would lead and guide us, your word says, into all all truth, because you are the spirit of truth. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the good news of your word. We pray that you would bring revelation, that you would set captives free this morning, in Jesus' name. I uh, thank you, Father, we're not just uh, playing around with your word, but, Father, we want, to, we want to live it to the full, live it to the max, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, last week we looked at Genesis chapter 16 in the Word and uh, we saw how Abram and Sarah tried to fulfil God's promises their way rather than his way. We saw that uh, uh, Sarah had encouraged Abraham to sleep with the servant Hagar and that then Hagar become pregnant runs away because uh, of her relationship with Sarai. They become embittered to each other. Sarah uh, begins to treat her badly and she begins to uh, disrespect Sarai and look down on her. And we saw the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar while she was in the desert and told her that she would receive the blessing through her son. And this encounter is where we see the Hebrew name of God, El Roy, originated from, meaning the God who sees me. And that's what Hagar, this maidservant, says to the angel of the Lord. She, she calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. And we must never forget, he is the God who sees us. In every circumstance, in every situation, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, says the Lord. Amen. So let that be your courage. Hold on to the word of God. Let's stir up that gift of faith this morning. Amen. So uh, Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. I hope you've got your Bibles, otherwise you won't know if what I'm saying is truth or not. So Genesis chapter 17, and you can follow, follow along with the text as it comes up as well. So when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between you and me, and you will be greatly increased your numbers. Abram fell down onto his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. Okay, so we saw previous weeks, you can look them up, how the covenant took place and God made a covenant with Abraham. 
And then again, we see God appearing. And this time he appears, uh, I am God Almighty. You know, and sometimes, you know, th there's such importance in the name because it stirs our faith in different ways. And when we want the authority of Jesus, we might, we might refer to him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But maybe when we want the healing from Jesus, we would, we would refer to him as our healer. When we need the peace of Jesus, we might say our shalom, he is our peace. And so often a name that you approached God with or God spoke to you from announcing his name was going to make a massive impact on the situation that was being faced. Okay, So this situation, God announces himself and he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me blameless. In other words, there's nothing I can't do. And then he goes on to say, I will increase your number. Now that sounded crazy, we know, to Abram because Sarah was barren. And, uh, but God re-establishes his covenant to him. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. And often God takes us so far, but then comes back in and reminds us of our covenant. And that's why we read the word of God. Faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. And when you read the word of God, it stirs up our faith. We remember the promises that God has said to us. And we, if, if, by doing that, we become stronger in our faith because we know what God has said. And God also comes in and extends that blessing or that covenant or that situation. With Abraham, he'd already blessed him. He'd already said he was going to be uh, uh, greatly increased in numbers. He'd already said all that to him. But now God is coming back in and he's saying, look, apart from that, I'm going to extend then this covenant, I'm going to add to the covenant even more blessing than you were expecting. And sometimes we settle, we settle too quickly. You know, how much has God got set aside for you? The goodness is to bless you, the riches of his glory, the greatness of his love. And sometimes we taste and we see, we have like tasters. And we think that the taster is actually the meal, but it's not. It's just the taster. And you have a little taste. You go to restaurants sometimes and they give you a little taste of the food before you order the main dish or, or a glass of wine in a nice restaurant. They give you a little taste before you decide whether you want the full glass. And often for us, you know, we settle with the taster. We settle with a little bit thinking, this, this is my lot, this is what God has got for me. But remember Jabez, he said, extend my territory. Hallelujah. And so there's an extending that takes place sometimes. Caleb's daughter, Caleb and Joshua, she asked her father for the land and for an extension of the land. So don't settle and shortchange yourself when God has so much more. Sometimes you're you're content with the taster instead of receiving the full meal. Amen? And then God goes on to change his name. Now, this 13 years have passed since the birth of Ishmael at this point, and 24 years have passed since God told Abraham that he would have many descendants. So, this isn't happening day after day. There's a, a time factor involved, and that's what difficult sometimes when we're waiting on the promise, it's the wait. The promise isn't the problem, it's the waiting for the manifestation of the promise and that can be really frustrating. And so uh, Abraham, uh, Abram means high and exalted father, okay? So he was already under the title, and remember a name was a title, the name was the meaning. And nowadays people call their children all sorts of things. And uh, uh, there's no meaning to it, there's no value in it. A lot of the time they're not named after anybody, it's not a prophetic name, it doesn't say anything about their future, it's just, it's just the name. 
you know. Uh, but in reality, these names had power, purpose, and promise attached to them, and prophecy. So Abram was already called High and Exalted Father. Now, you've got to think, that must be really tough. You've been waiting for a promise to be manifest for 24 years. Your name is High and Exalted Father, yet you're walking man barren. <laughs> it's like crazy to me, just madness. Uh, so High and Exalted Father. But then God changes his name to Abraham, which means Father of Nations. So one is high and exalted father, meaning uh, uh, your prestige and everything else, but now you're going to be a uh, father of many nations. Well, hang on a minute, there ain't much happening with me and Sarah right now. But God says, no, you're going to be father of many nations, and God often speaks where there's barrenness and brings through fruitfulness. Amen? But you, we've got to accept God's word, like... With Gideon, he said, come forth, you mighty man of valour. Gideon wasn't a mighty man of valour at that moment in time. He was a chicken. He was hiding. He was petrified. He was saying, don't pick me, pick somebody else. But it was a prophetic statement over his life. And this was a prophetic name change that God was making in Abram's life. Abram means father of nations. And we'll see the significance of that in a, a little while. We also see that God called Abram to walk before him blameless. So uh, there, there's an expectation that God had on Abraham. Okay? And he said, look, you've got to walk before me blameless. You've got to be righteous before me. And, you know, we're the same. We, we might walk in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, but equally we've got to walk in obedience to the word as well. Second Timothy Chapter 1, verse 9, he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. But now it has been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Hallelujah. So there's an expectation that we walk in holiness and we have the imputed holiness and righteousness of Christ Jesus. I'm not holy because of my behaviour. I'm holy because he is holy and I have become a part of him. I am joined with him. So therefore I become holy. It's not my good works that can make me holy because they were never good enough in the first place. Scripture says your finest works are like filthy rags before me and there, there was nothing I could do to make myself holy and Jesus has covered me with his holiness therefore I am holy and set apart so jumping back verse 6 I will make you very fruitful not just a little bit but very fruitful uh, I will make nations of you and kings will come from you I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between you and your between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your god and the god of your descendants after you the whole land of Cana where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you I will be their God. Hallelujah. Then God says to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for generations to come. For this is my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now let's remind ourselves of what the covenant means. The co a covenant was a legally binding agreement between two or more parties which entered into of their own free will. So they weren't forced into it, it was a free will decision. And God had made the covenant upon himself because there was no one greater to swear by. Now, you know, the, the, what could God 
whereby there was nothing other than himself that he can, could validate him. You know, sometimes in life you might be moving to a property or whatever and you might need a guarantor. That, that's to say if you muck up and you don't make your payment, they are legally bound to make the payment on your behalf if you don't do it. And that's a guarantor, okay? But there was no one to be a guarantor for God because there was no one as great as God. There was no one to lean on. So God guarantees this covenant by himself. This covenant, uh, in this covenant, God told Abraham that he needed to circumcise himself and all the male descendants after him. Now, uh, uh, the old or, or new covenant was made by God, but it is kept by us. We have a part to play in the, in the covenant role. And God made a new covenant with us through Jesus Christ, that we are to walk into that new covenant. This was a covenant between Abraham and his offspring. Uh, it's not a covenant that uh, we are bound to because we come under a new covenant in Christ Jesus. God will never break the covenant. We are the ones who break the covenant. We do. We foul. We have sin. And, and, you know, we break the covenant. But God is not a covenant breaker, even when we break it. And sometimes in relationships, People say, oh, I'm in covenant relationship with you. You're a covenant brother. But when there's a situation arises, there's conflict, there's sin, there's an issue, something's gone wrong, there's a disagreement, you find that often the, one of the parties will walk away. Well, in a covenant, a covenant relationship says, no matter what happens, good, bad or indifferent, I am with you. That is my pledge. That's my covenant. Even if you treated me badly, I am in this and I will not walk away and I will fulfill the vows of the covenant despite your behaviour I will be true to the covenant so it totally changes how you look at relationships you know what relationships have you really got that are covenant based where either they've mucked up in your relationship or you've mucked up in the relationship but yet you've maintained the relationship that is a covenant relationship. Tried and tested. Often we think we're in covenant relationships with people, but it's never tested. But when it is tested, there's a failure and people walk away. Not only do people walk away, but they often do not want reconciliation at all. And at the same time, they want to walk around with this Holy Joe jargon of I'm a covenant brother. No, you're not a covenant brother. You've not understood it at all and you've walked away from your obligations. Okay? So let's, let's really get a grasp of what godly covenant relationships entail. What does God expect? You know, you, we, we think we can just walk away from each other left, right and centre. Well, I'm afraid that's not the case. You've really got a misunderstanding of Scripture and been taught badly if that's your thinking. You know, God is a God of reconciliation. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be different quarters because you don't like all these different people who are going to be in heaven with you for eternity. So let's just get it right now and then we've got a head start on things. Eh? So God told him, uh, Abraham, uh, he says, to, uh, God says, I will never break the covenant. We're the ones that break it. Israel broke the covenant time and time again and God has to come in and deal with their weaknesses. And it only takes one step of repentance to put right. If we broke the covenant, and I've broken covenants, and you've broken covenants, do you know what? We just repent, and it's, it can be fully repaired. We just forgive as well. You know, forgive is, is to bring to restoration as well. It's to love again. It's to give yourself again, and that's forgiveness. And I've met some amazing people in my time who have shown me that level of forgiveness, you know, with situations they've been through. And it is so awe-inspiring to see the reality of the Word of God in, in people's lives. So Genesis 17, verse 11. 
You are to undergo circumcision. It will be a sign of the covenant between you and me. For generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or those bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Now, the amazing thing is, well, what, I don't know why I say the word amazing when God is involved in it, because it's God. He, he is amazing. But medical uh, staff now know that on the eighth day of a baby's life, the levels of vitamin K are at their highest. And it's vitamin K that causes the blood to clot that would stop them bleeding to death. If the circumcision was done earlier or later, the baby could bleed to death because the blood would not clot properly. But God has ordained in his word that a baby be circumcised on the eighth day. And it just so happens to be that is the, the day that our bodies produce the most amount of vitamin K that causes blood to clot. <laughs> what, 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 exactly? Verse 13. Whether born in your household or bought with money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken the covenant. He has broken my covenant. Why circumcision, we are Circumcision was an appropriate sign of the covenant because it was a cutting away of the flesh. It was a severing of the flesh. And it would serve as a reminder to every man under this covenant uh, not to trust in his flesh because of the circumcised uh, uh, circumcision deals with the organ of procreation or uh, rep the pro reproduction. It's a reminder of going from one generation to another. And also the special seed that Abraham would bring forth in the Messiah. All covenants included a lasting, remember, uh, a lasting reminder as a witness. With God, there was... There was the rainbow, for instance. In this instance, God used circumcision as the reminder that man was in a covenant with God, a binding oath to walk before God blameless, just as his offspring had to as well. So this was a, a covenant that was going to go from generation to generation. Centuries later, we see how God reveals the meaning of the purposes of the covenant through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, through the Mosaic law. Uh, uh, the covenant is added to. And God turns around and says to them, I will circumcise your heart, therefore you will be stiff-necked no longer. And, you know, sometimes even now, a lot of the issues we face, in terms of uh, loving people, forgiving people, accepting people, it's actually their heart conditions. So you can do your quiet time every day and you can do your fasting and you can give your tithe and you can do all that and you can be very good with the outward things, but the things of the heart we're not quite so good with. But God looks upon the heart and that is his barometer. And on the outside you can look the... You can look the part, but it's actually the heart that matters. Circumcision meant a removal of a hard, sinful heart to purge themselves from sin and to live in obedience unto the law. To the nation of Israel, it was a permanent reminder that they needed to obey God's law. And it also reminded them of the blessings that they were inheriting. The topic of circumcision was brought up in the New Testament when the apostles were writing to Jewish converts and there was much confusion and arguments uh, began to rise up in the early church as to whether circumcision was necessary still for Jews and also for Gentiles. Could a Gentile be saved if they weren't undergoing a physical circumcision? 
and we see the book of Galatians, it caused a lot of division and people falling out and arguing over the whole matter. And then the Apostle Paul makes clear that the act of circumcision was a type of shadow. It was a symbolism of what happens to a believer when they accept Jesus through faith, whether they be Jews from that point or Gentile. It was irrelevant. Colossians 2 verse 11 says, In him you were also circumcised in putting off the sinful nature, not with circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and rose again in, uh, through him, your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Water baptism is an act of circumcision. It was an outward sign, a demonstration that there had been a circumcision of the heart that took place in the life of the believer. And this was now a witness to all people that you were now a convert to Jesus Christ. Now remember, we are not under the old covenant law, but we are under grace. We are under the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ. We have entered, Scripture says, into a better covenant containing better promises. Wow! So all those promises of, that Abraham received, as a believer today, you receive an even greater covenant promise with a God who has made the covenant through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Don't you want to discover all what that is? Hebrews 9 verse 13, Hebrews 9 verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered to him unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Wow, what a liberating scripture that we have. And that also... A key point in this that is that we uh, will be sanctified ourselves, that we have been cleansed so that we may serve the living God. See, in the Old Testament, it was only the priests who could serve God in that sense. But we, through this new blood covenant, can serve God ourselves in that intimate priestly relationship. Paul makes a powerful statement in Corinthians 7 verse 19 and he says circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, keeping God's commands is what counts and it ties up the issue what the early church began to debate who was and wasn't saved and what ceremonial uh, things had to be connected to salvation and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, Jesus just wiped that all away with a new covenant. And you see these great apostles stepping in. And, and Paul was a great Jewish theologian before he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he knew the theology of the word of God. He knew it very well. It was very, very, very well accomplished. Not just in the scriptural traditions, but the traditions of the Jewish people. And he says it on many occasions. So Genesis 17, verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and will surely give, her, uh, give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations and kings of people will come from her. What a powerful blessing. Not only would she have a child, but kings. She will be the mother of nations. 
kings and peoples will come from her. What a wonderful, wonderful promise of God. She's not just going to have a baby. She's going to give birth to a nation. That her offspring will sit enthroned over the people of Israel. Not just anyone. Wow. In the Old Testament times, the name of a person represented their identity or their title, their character or experience. And God changed Abram's name to Abraham, <coughs> which means, as we saw earlier, exhorted father to father of nations and of great multitudes. And he changed Sarai's name, which meant uh, she who strives, to Sarah, putting a H in it, meaning princess. So both of them have now had an identity change. Now, it's interesting to see that this identity change didn't come years earlier when God called them out of Haran. It didn't come when they entered the promised land. It came at a later point. And sometimes we can think we've received all that we're going to receive from the Lord. But that's not the case. And God can continue to bless you and bless you and bless you through the covenant relationship with him. And when he decides to step in, oh, what joy. What joy. We live in expectation. We live in faith. Abraham and Sarai never expected more blessing, greater blessing. And even though they doubted the original blessing, God doesn't punish them. He actually pours out an even greater blessing upon them both. And you think, well, hang on a minute. You didn't even believe the first time I gave you the blessing. You didn't really receive it. You doubted. And we would probably not give any more upon those conditions. But God lavishes them with even more. Why? Because it's not dependent on them. It's dependent on him. It's his covenant. Hallelujah. And sometimes we think the blessings are all dependent on us and how be our knowledge and our behaviour and our righteousness. And we forget, no, God is the covenant maker, not us. And sometimes you see God blessing other people or churches or ministries, and you can look and say, well, why not me? Well, it's up to God. God's the blessing. God is the covenant maker. And so he changes both of their names. Sarai, which had strived, she'd strived all her life, probably because of not having children. She strived with herself. She strived with so much of her identity. And sometimes you can be striving and striving with who you are and your identity and where you are in life. And sometimes we've got to put that striving aside and say, no, you know, I'm a gift of God. No, God, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be identified by who, by what I've done. I'm going to be identified by who he says I am. Amen. And God gives us a new name. And so, uh, up to this point, Sarai had strived, she was barren, so on and so forth. And even her plans to have a, a child through Hagar and try and turn the family around that way had all gone sour, it had all gone wrong. God, through the promises to them, was installing another part of the covenant in the change of name. He was changing their identities. He was enlarging their capacity and their vision. And sometimes we need to enlarge our capacity and our vision again. Although these changes of name came from God, they were actually a, an exchange of name almost with God. Even though through the covenant of marriage we see that the bride under normal circumstances will take the name, the surname of her husband as a part of the covenant ritual. And when a woman takes that name, she receives something with that. Uh, the husband becomes a father. So the father releases his name, the natural father, 
and the bride takes on her husband's name. Why? Because he becomes a father to her. She receives a provision under that name. She receives protection under that name. There's all these things that take place in the exchange of name in a covenant marriage ceremony. And suddenly God was giving them a new name and he was saying, look, I'm in this covenant, I'm including you in my name. And God gives them a part of his own name through this new marriage covenant. with which he changes their name, and God adds a part of his very own name into their names. God's name in Genesis is Jehovah or Yahweh, and that's how they would have seen and approached God. Jehovah, Jireh, my provider, Yahweh. And in Hebrew, Jehovah and Yahweh could be spelt Y-H-W-H. -H. Y -H W H and there was no vowels in the name. So God inserts both of the H's from his name. H being the predominant and the uh, most frequent letter in his name. And God puts this predominant letter for, from his name into their name. And Abram becomes Abraham with a H inserted. And Sarai become Sarah with a H added to her name as well. And the amazing thing, after Yahweh and Jehovah, uh, 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 after this, Abraham is then uh, known, or God is then known as the God of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? From this point, God is referred to by generation after generation after generation of Israelites are you not the God of Abraham? And God is identified through Abraham's name. And Abraham's name change identifies him as a covenant receiver in God. And we are covenant receivers in Christ Jesus because we have a far greater covenant than this. Isaiah 49 verse 16 says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God has written our names on the very palm of his hand. And the name Matthew in, in Hebrew is pronounced Matiyahu, which means gift of God. So please don't reject me from your life. I'm a gift of God into your life. And so we see this powerful change of name take place. And even in modern day society, we just see around us that Harry, uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle have now left the royal families. They've, they've said, look, we don't want to identify. We don't want the privileges and so on and so forth. And the Queen has taken away their royal status in some way, shape or form. And when you remove that, you also remove the benefits of that name. The benefits of that name would have brought them finances, prestige, honour, uh, referred to as royalty. They would have had all their various titles and lands and so on and so forth. And also those names would be covenantly passed on. Their children would have benefited from their parents being royalty. But they've stepped away when, and, and, you know, they've stepped, when you, they've stepped away from the covenant, they've stepped away from the name, they said, I don't want to use that anymore. And they've lost all the implications that came with that. But for us, we are in an eternal covenant with Christ Jesus. We are called Christians after Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We have been taken as mere mortal men and we have been included into a covenant relationship with the eternal God, the God of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega has said, you are mine and I have changed your name and I have changed your status and there's nothing you can do 
about it. It is an everlasting covenant with benefits that never change. In actual fact, they just improve and get better and better and better. And there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. And we approach the Father in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What a privilege. Oh, we think sometimes there's nothing in the name. Even the demons hear the name of Jesus and tremble. Wow. And, you know, I have a change of name after David here which is a legal document. And uh, this is uh, for myself because uh, on my birth certificate, I was named uh, Matthew Payne with, because my mum was a uh, husband at the time. That was his surname. But when uh, my mum was with my stepdad, he brought me up since I was three weeks old and uh, lived with me, uh, lived with him all my life. And my name was always used as Matthew Guest, not Matthew Payne. So when it came to getting married, legally I had to change my name by Depot because otherwise my wife would have become uh, Mara Payne. Can you imagine? She was working as a midwife at the time. Can you imagine being a patient? And then the doctors come along or the nurse comes along and says, oh, this is your midwife. Uh, she's called Midwife Payne, and she's going to be here while you have your baby. You would run a mile, I'm telling you. And so uh, I had to change my name legally so that she would become Mrs. Guest. And to do that, I had to take on uh, and, and renounce and relinquish the power and the authority and the rights of that old names. And it's just a couple of points I'm going to read out. I'm not going to read them all out, but it says, as, a, as an affidavit, okay, legal document, it says, I absolutely, myself, Matthew Guest, I absolutely entirely renounce and relinquish and abandoned the use of my former surname of pain. And I assume and I adopt and determined to use from the date hereof the surname of guest in substitution for my former name of pain. I shall therefore at all times and in all deeds, records and documents, other writings, in all translations, on whatever use and subscribe to the name of guest as my surname in sub substitution of the former name of pain. I relinquish the uh, aforesaid and intend thereafter that I will be uh, distinguished not by the former name of pain but by the name of guest only. I authorise all required persons at all times to designate and describe and address me by the adopted name of guest, in the witness whereof I have undergone to subscribe my Christian or first names or names known as Matthew John and to adopt and substitute the surname of guest. Also, the former name of pain I have affixed and sealed to the day of the first written letter. So that's a really powerful, legally binding document. And you can see, you know, when we come, when God changes our name, when you become born again, when you become a child of God, all those old prefixes that you were known under are gone and they are wiped out. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you are. Under Jesus Christ, you have a new inheritance. You have a new name. You have a new birthright. And we have to step into these things. And Abram and Sarah, uh, Abram and Sarah became Abraham and Sarah. And they became locked into a relationship with God with the various promises. And those covenant promises just enlarge. I love it where in the Psalms it says, your promises are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful that our God 
made a covenant with himself in Jesus Christ because it had to be a, a, an eternal covenant for Jew and Gentile that would usher us into eternal life and a relationship with God the Father. Why? Because he simply loves us. He loves you. God loves you. He loves you. And he holds you in a covenant. Yea, though we fail. Yea, though we stumble. Yea, though we muck it up and we get it wrong. He sustains us and he holds us. And he says, no, look at the name over them. My banner is over them. My name is over them. They are the blood washed. They are the covenanted ones. And we become not only covenanted to God, but we become covenanted to one another. Wow, awesome, awesome. What's in the name? What's in the name? The power of a change of name can bring the change of identity and the promises for our tomorrows. God bless your heart. I pray that this morning's word has blessed you, encouraged you. Please remember to share it on your social media. Don't forget to look us up. You can. Please remember to give to Effective Life Church. You can do that through our website. Really easy. Just go on the first page. Or if you want to donate to my own ministry, Effective Life Ministry, then you can do that off of my website. Just go to my own page and you'll see that as well. What a privilege to, to, to really come into and understand the Word of God in its fullness. Have a fantastic week. I pray that you'll be blessed this week and you'll be encouraged this week and you will remember who you are in the covenant made by Jesus. Take care. God bless your heart.